on the organizational side. So we are um, very happy to have uh, Fiala Shannon today. Uh, Fiala is currently assistant professor of physics at MIT. Um, she's working on various aspects in theoretical nuclear and particle physics. One aspect of her work is on overcoming computational limitations in QCD calculations, particularly using modern machine learning techniques. And today she will tell us about recent work in this direction and how to build uh, symmetries into generative flow models. So we're very excited to hear about this uh, work. So please, Fiala, uh, we're very much looking forward to your talk. Thank you very much. Okay, so in the spirit of this series at the intersection of physics and machine learning, my goal for this talk is to start with the physics and outline a particular computational challenge that stands between us and the ability to do some very exciting theory calculations. And then come to how we might be able to meet this challenge with machine learning and especially machine learning that builds in the symmetries of, of our physics theories. So the grand physics challenge that I'm discussing is understanding the structure of matter from the most fundamental degrees of freedom that we understand. To the best of our understanding, um, all of the matter that we interact with in Earth, so all of the visible matter in the universe, is made of atoms and atomic nuclei, where those nuclei are made of protons and neutrons, and those protons and neutrons themselves have a deeper substructure matter particles called quarks held glued tightly together by the force carriers of the strong force known as gluons. So to the best of our understanding, this theory describes from the structure inside a single proton all the way to the nuclear reactions in the first moments after the Big Bang, um, to the dynamics in the interior of a neutron star. And this theory the standard model of nuclear and particle physics with just 17 fundamental particles um, and the interactions which can be expressed in a very compact form, like on the coffee mug on this slide, um, describes what we understand about nature. So in principle, if we can calculate all the way up to nuclear physics within this theory, we can see how um, the periodic table how the complexities of nuclear physics emerge from our fundamental understanding of the most basic degrees of freedom in the universe. Also, we of course know that this theory, although it's the most successful physics theory we've ever had, um, doesn't describe everything in the universe. So in particular, well, just one example is dark matter which we have abundant experimental evidence for, that there's matter that interacts gravitationally um, but doesn't interact with light, so it's dark. But this is not described by our physics theory. And so, of course, a great goal of, of physics research is to understand physics beyond the standard model. But to do that, we, of course, need to understand the standard model itself. And it's particularly critical for many searches to physics beyond the standard model to understand nuclear physics to a very good extent. So that's relevant to searches for new physics at what we call the intensity frontier. So these are experiments with the sensitivity to probe the rarest standard model interactions and look for deviations over our expectation. So this includes things like dark matter direct detection, which I've already mentioned. So looking for direct evidence of dark matter interactions with nuclei here on Earth, neutrino physics experiments, and, and so on, where the challenge with these rare interactions is that to increase the chances of seeing something, you need to assemble a very great amount of whatever material you're looking for an interaction in. So in the case of dark matter direct detection, a very large detector, and the way we assemble very large amounts of matter on Earth is via nuclei. So the physics challenge then is to understand the standard model physics of nuclei that we use as targets and experiments um, that describe the matter that we, we interact with. Okay, so this is the grand physics problem. The computational problem comes in, in, in trying to do this in practice, in trying to go from our, our theory, the standard model of particle physics, and calculate 
the properties of matter, especially nuclei, from that theory. The particular piece of the standard model that's challenging um, is that piece that describes the strong nuclear force, that's quantum chromodynamics or QCT. So this is the strongest of the four forces. It binds quarks and gluons into protons and neutrons and other particles. It binds the protons and neutrons in nuclei. It, it forms other types of exotic matter like the quark gluon plasma. But of course, since I'm talking about, say, the structure of a nucleus, the force that binds the quarks into the nucleons and the nucleons into the nucleus is, of course, critical to understanding that structure. So studying the strong interactions um, from the standard model is challenging because the coupling of that theory, the interaction strength, becomes large at low energy. And low energy is, of course, what's relevant when we're talking about the structure of a nucleus at, at rest. So if you have a small coupling, which is in fact what you have for the strong interactions at high energy, then you can use perturbative methods. You can expand in powers of that coupling. And two powers of the coupling are smaller than one. Three powers of the coupling are smaller again. Right? And so you can build a series and truncate at some point and know you've controlled your uncertainties. When the coupling is large, however, like it is for the strong interactions at low energy, it, the theory is non-perturbative and we can't do such an expansion. So the only way we know to study the strong interactions in this non-perturbative regime is via a discretization of the theory onto a four-dimensional space-time lattice and then solving the discretized equations numerically in calculations on supercomputers. So this is named quite obviously lattice QCD because of the space-time lattice that we discretized the theory onto. And what the numerical calculations then look like are very high dimensional numerical integrals. So these are integrals over the values of the quark and gluon um, fields, which have been projected onto the sites and links of this four dimensional space time lattice. Since we have this high, something like 10 to the 12 dimensional integral, um, we, we do this via important sampling. So you can think of this just in a, in a straightforward way as understanding that we know, of course, in quantum mechanics that paths near the classical action dominate and paths that are long excursions from the classical path uh, are, are less important. And so if we need to calculate such a high dimensional integral by sampling, then we can sample according to how important those contributions are. So sample the dominant configurations more and sample the less important configurations less. So we do the calculation by important sampling. And then once we have that set of samples, we can calculate physics on that set of samples of the background quark and gluon fields. So to be just a little bit more precise, I've drawn here a, a lattice. Of course, I couldn't draw it in four dimensions, but we've discretized the theory so that the quarks, the matter fields, live on the sites of the lattice. And then the gluon fields, so those are the force carriers of the strong force, live on the links. And we'll see those a lot during this talk. Of course, there's a range of systematics that you have to take care of. You have a finite lattice spacing and you have to take the limit as the lattice the spacing becomes small to recover continuum physics. You have to take the limit as the volume of this box becomes large and so on. But then just to put it mathematically, the calculations that we want to do look like this integral here, where this is an integral over the quark and gluon fields O here is just some operator that describes something we want to calculate, maybe something about the structure of the proton that's a function of the fields. And that integral is weighted here with an exponential of the action, where that action describes the, the quark and gluon dynamics in the theory. And we calculate this just by sampling, where we've sampled the field configurations already distributed according to that weighting of the action. So this is the computational setup of the problem. I just want to emphasize that this numerical first principles approach, it's systematically improvable. The only free parameters are the same free parameters as the theory of QCD itself. So once you fix those by matching to some number of experimentally measured quantities, maybe masses of some particles, then everything else you calculate in this numerical method, so all the way up to the structure of carbon, is a prediction from the theory itself. So this is the goal. Okay, so the workflow of a calculation like this is first you generate these samples of the field configurations. 
We typically do this via hybrid Monte Carlo that I'll talk a lot more about in this talk. So this is a massive computational task. It takes leadership class computing, so that's talking about hundreds of thousands of cores or thousands of GPUs, tens of teraflop years. And in the end, you want order thousands of these samples where each sample is 10 to 100 gigabytes. And this is something that I'll talk about accelerating via machine learning. I just want to mention very briefly that there are, of course, other aspects of the workflow. You have to do very large, sparse matrix inversions, essentially solving the Dirac equation to compute quark propagators. You also have to do contractions to form your final um, observables of interest. And both of these are things that you might think about accelerating with machine learning too, but that's not the focus of the talk today. So the problem for nuclear physics then is that although we can apply these methods and get very precise percent level results for many aspects of the structure of a single proton, the computational cost grows exponentially with the size of the nuclear system. So if you want to do calculations for nuclear physics, um, you're very quickly limited in the size of the nucleus you can study unless you can develop algorithms that overcome this exponential scale. Okay, so the precise computational task that we want to address with machine learning is this problem of generating field configurations sampled according to a known probability distribution. So this field configuration phi here um, is, is represented here by phi. I think you can see my cursor. And we want to sample them according to an exponential weighting of the action, which is just a function of phi that we can compute. So this sampling task, these field configurations are represented on the links of this lattice here. And on each link of the lattice you have, in the case of QCD, an SU3 matrix. So that's a three by three complex matrix with unit determinant and where the inverse of the matrix is the same as the conjugate transpose. So in state of the art calculations, that works out to something like 10 to the 12 double precision numbers per sample. And then we want to sample these each sample is 10 to the 12 numbers. We want to sample these according to S, which is the function that defines the quark and gluon averages. Quark and gluon dynamics, sorry. Okay, so the typical method we use to do this sampling now that we want to improve upon is known as Hamiltonian or hybrid Monte Carlo. So it's just a coupled Hamiltonian dynamics with a Markov chain Monte Carlo. So you think about um, classical motion according to a Hamiltonian here, where this is our action. And these here are conjugate momenta, where we've randomly sampled these conjugate momenta and then evolved for some amount of time in a nice reversible volume preserving evolution. So we're updating from one field configuration to the next. The problem with this is that you have um, numerical integrators, which are not exact. So you have an energy non-conservation, uh, non which you can then fix. So you get the um, right um, asymptotic distribution via an accept reject step. So you have a chain of samples, you accept reject with a given probability which corrects this numerical error. So since you're doing an updating procedure, you're, you're updating the configuration from one to the next and to have a high acceptance rate we need to have quite short trajectories. And this is where some of the problems with this arise. So just to visualize this a bit better, you can imagine this as a ball rolling through your probability density space. <clears throat> and at every step, you give that ball a push with some random momentum and you let it roll for a little while and then you stop and you have another sample in your space. And so it's a coupled position and momentum walk through Hamiltonian dynamics to explore this space. So you're simultaneously exploring the level sets of this probability distribution and being able to jump to nearby sets while sampling in a way that preserves the probability distribution. Okay, so what this approach gives you is, is a chain. So you're updating from one configuration to the next. And because you have these fairly short trajectories to have a high acceptance probability in, in your chain, you have some correlation between the samples in your chain. So you start off, you have some burn-in period that you discard because you're not sampling the asymptotic probability distribution yet. And then you continue sampling, but because the samples are correlated, you, you throw away most of them and keep only every nth sample. 
where the size of n is dictated by the correlation length, so the autocorrelation time. And if you have a shorter autocorrelation time, of course, you have to throw away less samples, and so you have um, less computational cost. So this autocorrelation becomes a particular issue when we want to think about going to fine lattice spacing, which is, of course, a limit we have to take to recover continuum field theory. Since if you think about these updates being as diffusive or, or close to local, then if you want to change a configuration at a fixed physical length scale, say the size of a proton, then the number of updates you need to change the correlations on that fixed physical length scale diverges as the lattice spacing becomes small. You have to do more and more updates to, to achieve decorrelated configurations. So this is known as critical slowing down. You can make a measure of the autocorrelation time, this integrated autocorrelation time here, which is just given by this formula where this row here is the correlation of some observable, something that you can calculate on a configuration, on configuration separated by tau Markov chain steps. And what you can see in this figure here is that as you approach the critical limit, as the lattice spacing becomes small, this autocorrelation time, which you can think of as being a measure of cost, yeah, it, it, it grows, so it diverges, and we have a log scale on that vertical axis, so it diverges badly. And this is a key barrier towards doing um, precise first principles calculations for nuclear physics. And accelerating this stage of the lattice calculations would be very significant in terms of um, the physics consequences. So accelerating gauge field generation by machine learning is then the the computational challenge. We've explored this in various ways. For today, I'm going to focus on generative models to replace the hybrid Monte Carlo process. So can we generate configurations from the right probability distribution without a chain of updates so that they're not correlated? Something very important in this application of machine learning is that we have a method that is a first principles approach to understanding our theory of the standard model of particle physics. And it's systematically improvable with controllable uncertainties. So we don't want to throw that away. So we want to consider only approaches which let us rigorously preserve the fact that we're studying this specific quantum field theory in all of the right limits, which means that we don't want to introduce any extra uncertainties. We need to guarantee that in the right limits, we're sampling from the right probability distribution. Okay, so this work's of course done by a group of, of very talented people. It's a collaboration between my group at MIT, um, a team at Google DeepMind and NYU. So I wanna point out in particular, Tej Kanwa is one of the senior graduate students who's been leading a lot of this work and he is answering questions live in the chat and I'll answer more questions at the end of the talk, of course. Okay, so let's start with a test case of a scalar lattice field theory. So this is a lattice field theory where we just have one real number per site on a two-dimensional lattice. So you can picture what the field configurations that we're trying to sample look like here. Okay, we want to sample configurations that look like this based on the action, right? We want the probability distribution to be this exponential weighting of the action. And the action is here, just a function of the fields. We have some derivative terms. We have squared terms and quartic terms in the fields. We have a coupling here. This is a free parameter and, and, and the mass. And those two parameters describe our theory entirely. So we then want to sample field configuration. We want to generate them with this probability distribution, which means that we want configurations which look like this in this example, and, and we don't want contribution uh, field configurations that look like this very often. This is just random noise. You can see it's very unlikely. Um, but a critical point is that I said we don't want them very often. We, of course, want to sample them precisely as often as they should be sampled according to the probability distribution. Okay. I also want to thank Tej for a lot of the nice diagrams in this part of the talk. Okay, so this sampling problem then has parallels, of course, with the image generation problem that's received a lot of attention in the last few years, 
that we want to sample configurations that look like this, but not like this. Much like if you're trying to generate images of faces, you want images that look like this and not like this. With, of course, the key difference that we do want this, just very infrequently. Whereas if you're generating faces, I guess you never want that. OK, so then here's the problem. Um, we can compute the probability density. We have a few other differences from the image generation problem in that we have precise symmetries, which I'll talk more about in, in the second part of this talk. And the data hierarchies of our problem are also very challenging. So the state of the art calculations, we have something like 10 to the 9 to 10 to the 12 variables per configuration. But ultimately, we want order thousands of samples, so fewer samples than the numbers of degrees of freedom per sample which means that clearly it will be very hard to try to use any training paradigms that rely on having existing samples from the distribution. So ideally, we want a method that is self-training. So the other thing, of course, is that we want to be able to guarantee that we're sampling from the right probability distribution, which means that we want to be able to calculate the likelihood for each sample that's produced. So one method that lets us do this is flow-based models. So the idea is, is very simple. You're trying to learn a change of variables that takes you from an easily sampled probability distribution to an approximation of your desired probability distribution. And if you can learn a parameterization of a function that does that, that takes you from this easily sampled distribution here to the distribution you like that is invertible, and that has a tractable Jacobian, then we'll be able to um, also do, say, an accept-reject step to correct to have the desired asymptotic probability distribution of our samples. OK, so we can build such a function by composing it through many simple layers. And if we design those many simple layers in a specific way, we can also guarantee that we have this invertible model with attractive Jacobian. OK, I can see that there are questions in the Q&A, but I can't see what they are. So I'll get them at the end of the chat. OK, so for the case of scalar field theory, we can think about applying flow models that exist in the literature. So for example, real non-volume preserving flows. The idea is that we're making an um, affine transformation, so that's just a function between affine spaces that preserves points, straight lines, planes, of half of the variables at the time. So if we take this variable splitting pattern here, so for example a checkerboard, and we leave half of the variables alone, but transform the other half of the variables, the black variables here, where we're transforming them based on information about the frozen half, then what we can get is a nice um, lower triangular Jacobian structure, which lets you calculate the Jacobian of the full transformation by stacking these layers and the inverse in, in a simple way. So just to decompose some of the language here, non-volume preserving just means that the density can be squashed or stretched by this change of variables. And like I said, this variable splitting, so choosing just half of the variables to transform at a time, um, guarantees that our Jacobian is a nice lower triangular form and is easily computed, but it also lets us use, say, physically motivated choices of variable splits like checkerboarding, which builds in correlations between your nearest neighbors. Okay, so we can design a model to do this change of variables. We know the target distribution up to normalization, so we can optimize the parameters of this model to minimize the shifted KL divergence, so just taking the KL divergence and, and shifting it by log Z to remove the unknown normalization. That means that this loss is not, um, not bounded by zero below, it can become negative, but that doesn't influence anything about the training. And by choosing this specific um, direction of the KL divergence, if we write it out in full form like this, you see that we can minimize this via self training because the only thing that appears here is P tilde. P tilde here is our model probability density, and P is our desired probability density. So the only thing that appears here is P tilde, 
and also the action S. And so we can sample, we can compute this by sampling with respect to the model distribution to estimate the loss function. So we don't need samples from the distribution itself to start with. Okay. We of course want to guarantee exactness of the generated distribution as I emphasized before. We can do this by composing all of our samples into a Markov chain and then doing an accept reject step with this probability here, which is given by ratios of the true distribution here in highlighted in purple and the model distribution here highlighted in orange. So then you can think that we have a um, embarrassingly parallel sampling procedure where you just sample from the easily sampled distribution, feed it through the model, get your configuration out the other side, but we then take those and compose them into a chain, accepting or rejecting each sample based on the previous one. And, and this then gives us the right asymptotic probability distribution. Okay, so to outline the process here, we, then, we parameterize this change of variables using some, some coupling layers. I described these real non-volume preserving coupling layers where each layer has some arbitrary neural networks doing the, the scaling and then transformations. So we have a lot of free parameters to optimize in that function. The training is done by drawing samples from the model, computing the loss, gradient descent, iterating over this training, until at some stopping criterion, for example, if you have the desired accuracy, you save the trained model, and then you can just sample from the model, composing into a Markov chain and doing an accept reject to get the right asymptotic probability distribution. So returning to the scalar field theory, who I mentioned before, remember one real number per lattice site, and with an action with kinetic terms and this, this quartic coupling here, we studied this for five different lattice sizes, so up to 14 squared. Well, we choose the parameters, that's this m squared and this lambda parameter, to put us right along a critical line. So as we go to L, being the, the number of sites in one dimension of this lattice becoming larger, we're moving along the critical line where computation becomes more expensive via the usual methods. So, we train these models taking a, a prior distribution that's just an uncorrelated Gaussian. Then we took our model being some set of real non-volume preserving coupling layers. For this example, we had eight to 12 with an alternating checkerboard pattern. And then each of those coupling layers has neural networks in it with some fully connected layers. We then trained this, optimized the free parameters of this model using the shifted KL loss and an atom optimizer. And then we had our model. So we can generate samples from this model. And the first thing we can do is we can look at them, like you look at pictures of generated faces and see if we can see the difference between those generated by other methods. So in this top row, we have the output of our machine learned model, our, our flow-based generative model, um, trained to only about 50% acceptance. Here we have a local updating algorithm and hybrid Monte Carlo that I introduced in detail before. So the configurations look pretty good. They have correlations at about the right scale. We can look at the rejection runs when we take our sampled configurations and compose them into a chain. So how often are we rejecting the configurations? Do we get stuck in long rejection runs from sampling from our model? And the answer is that the rejection runs look very comparable to those from Hamiltonian Monte Carlo tuned to the same acceptance rate as of our, our machine learned model once we compose the samples into a chain. And we can also of course look at physical observables and so the uncertainties here are very small. We, we pushed a very high statistics to see that you get the right physics out as of course you should if you've guaranteed the right asymptotic probability distribution. So here are just some examples and you see that you cannot distinguish the physical observables computed on samples that we generated via this machine learn model and those that we generated via other um, conventional updating algorithms. You can also check whether the uncertainties follow the right statistical scaling, just to check that you're not generating samples which um, are very closely correlated with each other. 
And so then your uncertainties wouldn't follow the right scaling behavior. We have one over root n scaling for all of the models, the, the conventional algorithms, as well as the machine learning model. Okay, so we can then look at the integrated autocorrelation time, which now, of course, since we are independently sampling configurations and composing them into a chain, this autocorrelation time does not depend on what observable you're looking at. It's just a function of how often you're rejecting your samples. And so if we train our models to 50% acceptance, here's the integrated autocorrelation time. If you train to a larger acceptance, of course, that autocorrelation time is lower since you have a lower rejection rate. And for each of our ensembles here, this is moving along that critical line. To the right, we have a, a flat integrated autocorrelation time. For hybrid Monte Carlo, which is the, the sampling technique I introduced earlier, as you move to the right, of course, your integrated autocorrelation time increases for whichever different observables you might like to calculate, and it's the same for the local metropolis. So as opposed to these algorithms, we have a diverging computational cost in that critical limit. The computational cost of sampling is flat for the machine learned models. Although, of course, the cost is the upfront training of the model, which I haven't mentioned. Okay, so this was a nice example. We, we can train these sorts of generative models for field theories. But what we'll need to do to really reach our target applications of lattice QCD for nuclear physics is not just scale these up significantly, but also develop methods for gauge field theories, so not just real numbers, but matrices living on the links of these lattices. And so that's what I'll talk about in a moment. I just want to say as well that this scaling problem we need four dimensions and we need not 16 by 16 two dimensional lattices, but something much larger, something like 48 cubed by 96 or larger, is a significant problem. And so we're working with the Aurora 21 Early Science Project. Aurora is the name of the new largest supercomputer in the world to be built at Argonne National Lab in 2021 to see if we can develop ways of scaling our algorithms up for deployment on, on exascale hardware so that we can reach these, these very large sampling sizes. Okay, so the challenge of gauge field theories. So here we have field configurations represented, as I said, not by a real number at each site, but as matrices on each link here of this lattice. So it's U mu X, the X is representing the site of the lattice, and the subscript mu is the direction of the link coming out from that site. So for QCD, quantum chromodynamics, the theory of the strong interactions, each link is a three by three complex matrix with unit determinant. So this is different from the case that we discussed before in several ways. So firstly, the group valued fields obviously don't live on the real line, but on compact manifolds. Um, and secondly, we have actually that the action, so the probability density is invariant under some complex group transformations on the gauge fields. So I'll, I'll talk first about flows on compact connected manifolds, but then about how we can incorporate these symmetries, which helps you reduce the effective degrees of freedom. We have very large dimensional um, samples that we're trying to generate, but we also have very large dimensional symmetries. And so if we can incorporate those into the models, it can be a significant advantage for model training. Okay, so flows on compact and connected manifolds. So before we used real non-volume preserving flows. So essentially we have a probability distribution on, on the real line, and we want to learn a function that transforms it to a different probability distribution on the real line. A compact connected manifold, so for example, a circle, we have a probability distribution on the circle, and we want to transform it to another probability distribution on the circle. So an example here of an application is a U1 field theory. So that's instead of an SU3 matrix on each link, you have U1 group element on each link. And I'll talk about that example in detail later. Um, also an example is the positions of a robot arm with many segments. Of course, you have angles describing the position of, of each joint. And that also looks like a product of, of circle groups. Okay. So what we want is a diffeomorphism 
between our initial and our final manifold, so an invertible function that's mapping one differential manifold, differentiable manifold to the other so that both the function and its inverse are smooth. So here's a list of conditions for having a diffeomorphism. So the third condition here is that we want the transformation to be monotonic so it's invertible. The, the last condition here, this is just so that the Jacobians agree at zero and two pi, so the probability density is continuous. Here we're fixing um, fixed points at zero and two pi, but you can just compose this with a, a phase translation to remove that restriction, which is a volume preserving, um, volume preserving transformation. So we have here general conditions for diffeomorphism. So if we can find functions f that satisfy these conditions, then we can build flows out of those functions on the circle. We can combine, compose, different functions f, where of course you want to imagine each function as having some free parameters that we'll, we'll train, we'll learn. You can compose these functions f through just function composition or by taking convex combinations to get more expressive, more general functions with more free parameters that still satisfy the condition of this being a diffeomorphism. Okay, so in our collaboration, we explored this, this work of normalizing flows on these sorts of compact connected manifolds like tori and spheres. And we looked at a number of different transformations and I should say we're not the first to talk about any of these particular types of diffeomorphisms. But just to give you some example, you could think of a Mobius transformation. So you have here a complex number z on the unit circle. You parameterize the transformation by another complex number omega that lives inside this circle somehow. And you can make a transformation by taking a straight line between z and omega to the end of the circle, then back through the center to get here h of omega is a transformation of z. We can then compose that with just a rotation to fix f of theta equals zero and, and meet our criteria. And so what this transformation is doing is it's really expanding the part of the sphere close to omega and contracting the rest. Now this is one type of diffeomorphism that we can write down. This one doesn't actually become more expressive under composition, but you can combine it via convex combinations. Um, then it's no longer analytically invertible, but it's numerically invertible. Okay, an alternative is circular splines. So, and these ones are analytically invertible. So you can break up your, your angle onto each of k segments and on each segment you can write a rational quadratic function here. So here the free parameters parameterizing this are on each segment the alphas and betas. There are of course several conditions on these coefficients alphas and betas to guarantee this is a diffeomorphism um, just that the function so that it's strictly monotonically increasing and so that it's um, continuous at the boundaries of the segments are essentially the conditions. But this is an alternative. Lastly, you could think about a non-compact projection. So the idea is just to project to the real line and back again by, a, say, a tan and an arc tan. Here you just need to be careful with the endpoints. So this expression for f is not actually defined at the endpoints, but the gradient is. And then you can extend it f by continuity to the endpoints. Then you still need to be careful with numerical instabilities. Um, so, for example, by Taylor expanding about those endpoints to take care of that. So there's a number of different options of transformations that we can write down and out of which we can build flows on, on tori and spheres. So I just mentioned tori and spheres and I just talked about the circle, but we can just extend these straightforwardly to Cartesian products of circles and of intervals. So for example, the torus. So here's an example from this paper where well, here's some target density on the torus, this is just unwrapped here, and then non-compact projection, Mobius, circular splines, all succeed reasonably well at learning these target densities. So in fact, the Mobius and non-compact projections perhaps learned a little better, um, but the, the splines are the cheapest to invert since it can be done analytically. So there are advantages depending on your application to in any of these. You can also extend these constructions recursively to higher dimensional spheres by, say, taking your sphere, mapping it to 
the Cartesian product of your circle and an interval, so, so to the cylinder, and then mapping it back. And then you just have to be careful that these recursive map transformations, see T here, here, and here, that these are numerically stable and that the density is well behaved everywhere. Um, we also explored exponential map flows to avoid mapping between non-diffeomorphic sets, but we didn't see any practical advantage in that and the density update is expensive. That's also discussed in this paper. Okay, so there are ways of constructing flows on compact connected manifolds. What about symmetries? So firstly, incorporating symmetries is not essential for the correctness of the machine learning generated ensembles. But especially when we have such high dimensional models with very high dimensional symmetries, we expect that incorporating the symmetries will be very important in being able to actually train these models. And that's in fact what we found. So a flow defined from coupling layers will be invariant under a certain symmetry if the prior distribution, so the, the easy to sample distribution that we take is symmetric and each coupling layer is invariant under the symmetry. And, uh, equivariant under the symmetry. By that I mean that all of the transformations commute through the application of each coupling layer, the symmetry transformation. So in gauge field theories, we could think about QCD, which is a gauge field theory with an SU3 group, or we could think about gauge field theories with, with other um, groups. So for example, U1 field theory just takes us back to the circle that we've already discussed. The symmetry that we have is that our action, so our probability density, is invariant under a separate group transformation of each link matrix. So we have here a link matrix, and a gauge transformation is to update that link matrix to a new one by multiplying with one group element here on the left and with a different group element here on the right, like this. So the transformation is parameterized by a different group element at each site here. So what you're really doing is taking a field configuration where maybe every link looks very similar and through a gauge transformation, you're transforming each link in a different way. So you get something that looks very different naively, but these encode exactly the same physics. Okay, so we can define an invertible and gauge equivariant coupling layer. And out of those coupling layers, we can then build a gauge equivariant flow. So we'll define a coupling layer G here so that G goes from an ND, that's the number of space time dimensions, times V, that's the lattice volume, dimensional set of group elements. So think about for each site here in our lattice volume, we have a link here and a link here, so in each of the ND directions. And remembering that variable splitting, so acting on only half of the variables or some fraction of the variables in a layer with respect, doing that update with respect to the other fraction was what gave us that the Jacobian is lower triangular and easily computed. We want to do the same thing here. So we're going to split up the variables into two sets, UA and UB, and we'll update UAs to be U prime A's, and we'll parameterize that transformation with links that are frozen in the coupling layer, so links from this set UB. So we can define an equivariant kernel, an equivariant coupling layer in terms of a kernel H. And so I'll explain it here and then I'll show diagrams on the next slide, which should make it clearer. So here is the link that we're going to update through the coupling layer, U prime. Remembering that the gauge transformation gives you a different matrix at the start of your link at the end of your link. If we update links by way of loops that start and end at the same point, for any product of links that starts and ends at the same point, a gauge transformation multiplies you with the same matrix on the left and its dagger on the right, right? So you don't have different matrices on either side anymore. Then we can build up a gauge equivariant transformation in a, in a, in a clean way. So that's what we're doing here. Remember, this is the updated link. This is the link we're starting with. This product of U and S is building a loop that starts and ends at the same point. If we have a kernel acting on that loop, and then we'll parameterize that function with respect to gauge invariant quantities constructed from UB, that's the frozen set. So this is just what we're parameterizing that transformation on. 
then we can multiply here by s dagger that's undoing this taking our link and composing it into a, a loop starting and ending at the same point we can then remove that piece at the end of the link at the end so then the coupling layer is equivariant under just a simple condition on this kernel that if you transform something that's been left and right multiplied with the same group element that those pop out of the kernel here and so for an abelian group this is true for any kernel and for non-abelian groups you can also construct kernels that behave like this so just to put this in um, to, to make this clearer and put it in a graphical form so let's say i want to transform this link here so first we're going to compose that link into here this loop that starts and ends at the same point by multiplying it with these other links here this one this one and this one and so i'm calling this product here this uis this yellow product i would just call that p and then the kernel h is updating p to p prime rewriting this expression here just in terms of this p prime the link update looks like this so we're just updating u to u prime via p so we're parameterizing that transformation in terms of some gauge invariant quantities constructed from elements of a set that we're not updating in this layer. So for example, you could take products of links here around just unit squares. And as long as we're not updating any of the links in those squares in this layer, these are gauge invariant quantities from the frozen part. So what that looks like here is P is going to P prime via this kernel H. So these are input into that kernel we have some distribution p, which is mapping to some distribution p prime via that kernel. Okay, and this, this lets us build a gauge equivariant layer. Just a couple more things to note is that, of course, this link here is updated. So if we took a product of links around a unit square here, that is also updated. That's what we'll call passively updated. But then the next product of links over here, this is again frozen in this layer. And so you can repeat this pattern across your lattice. And then in successive layers, update um, different sets of links so that after some number of layers, you've updated every link in the lattice through your group. Okay, so this was general and not specific to U1 field theory. Um, so this, this sort of an idea also works for other groups, but I'll show an example for U1. So there, each link is just one complex number on the unit circle, so just e to the i theta. The action, which defines the probability density, is expressed in just terms of plaquette. So that's product of links around closed loops with a single coupling beta here. So this is the action. And we studied this theory for a fixed lattice size, that's L squared of 16, so 16 sites in each of two dimensions, with a range of couplings. And so we're studying this with increasing couplings because that's the direction of the continuum limit. So we expect a critical slowing down in say hybrid Monte Carlo methods as beta becomes large. Okay, so we trained these models choosing the prior distribution to be uniform. We then parameterized the transformation with some number of gauge equivariant coupling layers. In this case, we had 24. We defined those kernels as mixtures of non-compact projections, which was just one of the transformations on circles that I mentioned. Um, where those are parameterized with convolutional neural networks. And by that, I mean that the output of the neural network gives the parameters of the non-compact projection. So we have a nice expressive function taking us from a prior distribution to some more complicated output distribution. And we can then train it in the same way using the same shifted KO loss that we defined before. Okay, so taking the same chart, from, from Tej Kanwa, it, the flow looks exactly the same now, that we start now, we've parameterized our flow using gauge equivariant coupling layers instead. We have training steps, we draw samples from the model, and, and we iterate over that until the model is trained to some um, desired accuracy or we've reached our stopping criterion. Then we can generate samples in an embarrassingly parallel way and compose them into a Markov chain. Okay, so, Doing this for U1 field theory, we again see this exciting success that we have a significant reduction in critical slowing down, again at the cost of upfront training of the model, but that's a once-up cost that's amortized over 
um, the number of samples that you want to take. So to show this, let's look at a sampling of the topological charge. So the topological charge here is defined by the sum of the arguments of P, where P is this product of links around a closed loop. This topological charge is the, the winding number of the gauge field. So it's, it's quantized and it's also a global variable. So you see that methods such as hybrid Monte Carlo and heat bath, they very slowly move between topological sectors. So you can see that they're very much frozen as we go to 100,000 Markov chain steps. The flow model, however, in orange here is, is sampling the topological charge extremely well. So here HMC is hybrid Monte Carlo and HB stands for heat bath. So another updating algorithm where every link on the lattice is updated every, every step. We can look at this in terms of the integrated autocorrelation time, which as I said, is a measure of the sampling cost. And here, as we increase beta, that's the coupling. So we move along that critical line. As you can see, the costs diverge exponentially for hybrid Monte Carlo and for heat bath. And for the flow-based method, down here at low beta, we have similar autocorrelation time to the heat bath method. But as we go to larger beta, we have orders of magnitude more efficient sampling. So you see that the, the flow model autocorrelation time does increase. And so that's just a function of um, being able to train to a lower acceptance. So we didn't do an exhaustive search over hyperparameters. We didn't change the model architectures at all, going from the low betas to the high betas. So it might be that if you use a more expressive model architecture with more layers, you'll get the integrated autocorrelation time down further here. But we, we did this so that the sampling cost for all of these is identical because the models are exactly the same size for each beta. I should also say that this is a fair cost comparison. So the cost per sample for HMC and for flow is about the same to within 10% on a single threaded CPU environment. The cost for heat bars is about a factor of two cheaper um, than either HMC or flow, but nevertheless, it's still orders of magnitude of cheaper sampling via the flow. Okay, so the other consequence of these very long autocorrelation times in HMC and heat bath, which we of course don't have in the flow based approach, is that those long autocorrelation times bias observables for any finite numbers of samples. So, just to give an example of this, we can look here at the topological susceptibility. So this is just the square of the topological charge that we mentioned before, divided by the volume. And you see that's shown here for different betas, where beta is the coupling. And you see that the flow results are precise, so small uncertainties from your 100,000 samples and exactly on the correct values. But you have biased answers for sampling via other means. And similarly here for just another observable which is the expectation values of L by L loops. So take the product of links around an L by L loop. And again, we have small uncertainties and um, unbiased answers from the flow model. Okay, so this is really a great success. It's a proof of principle of an efficient and exact machine learning algorithm for lattice quantum field theory. And of course it is not yet anywhere near the scale we need to use for state-of-the-art physics calculations. We need significant work to scale this to four dimensions, um, to large lattice volumes. And also I mentioned U1, but QCD is an SU3 group. So I can't tell you the details, but we have a paper on SU2 and SU3 coming out soon as well. Okay, so, so those challenges have also been addressed. So, just to give you an outlook, um, this is really exciting and machine learning accelerated algorithms really do have a huge potential to enable first principles nuclear physics examples, uh, physics studies. And I really only gave one example of applications to the sampling of gauge fields, but you could also potentially see other advantages and other aspects of the lattice workflow. And so this could, these sorts of tools could really enable physics calculations that are currently intractable. And as I said, the, the big physics goals are really being able to do calculations that let us understand nuclear physics from first principles, both to understand nuclear physics and to constrain searches for new physics beyond the standard model. So the big challenges are 
of course, training paradigms, um, how to actually train models, the very large models to make samples at a sufficient scale where every sample is tens or hundreds of gigabytes and how we can um, make our models and our training paradigms ready to implement on exascale hardware that will be needed. Just to finish, um, as, as I said, this has huge potential and it's not just that flow-based generation of gauge fields would enable this fast, embarrassingly parallel sampling and let us make high statistics calculations. But we've also found that you can retune trained models to nearby parameter sets, which gives us a nice handle on um, parameter space exploration for little extra upfront training cost. And also the fact that you could save just the trained models and not the samples would be a, an extra bonus. So this is an extremely promising direction. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you Fiala for a very nice uh, talk. Um, it's really uh, nice to hear this. Um, I see that there are some questions in um, Q and A. I don't know whether you can see them as well. Many of them have already been answered. Okay. But, so maybe there are also more coming in. So I see one question in the chat. I can't get the Q and A panel to open for some reason, but I'll try on my backup device. Um, so a question I see in the chat is why is it from Peter Yu Cheng Lu? Do why is it better to compose the samples into a Markov chain rather than directly important sample using all of the samples? So the answer to that is really that it's not just the sampling. You then also have to do a lot of computational work to compute physics on the samples. And that's also a non-trivial amount of work. So you don't want to do that work on samples, which will then contribute you know, a very small amount to your final answer because you're going to massively downweight them. So when that part of the work is also um, significant, then it makes a lot more sense to throw out via accept reject step and only do that extra work on important samples or with the correctly weighted samples. Okay, I see another question from Shan Quang Ding. The objective function DKL is not a convex function of P tilde. Is there a problem that the P tilde optimized with this objective function converges to a distribution that only covers one mode even when P is a multimodal distribution? Is there any technique that helps P tilde to escape from local minima? So multimodal distributions is something we've been investigating now. And, and the key seems to be that in your initial distribution, so when you take your initial um, samples and feed them through the flow, that you have enough overlap onto the various modes that you, you find them and continue to put density there as you train. So this seems to be really a, um, you, you have to be careful in your training paradigms, but you can address this. So this is something else that we're working on is how to deal with multimodal distributions. Okay, also, does it work as well on large systems which have high dimensional configurations, i.e. the distribution PX is a distribution over hundreds of thousands of dimensions, the local minima issue will become large for larger systems too. Yeah, so, right, so it is tricky to sample, uh, to, to train on these very high dimensional distributions. So training is, is critical. We do have one advantage that this is not an arbitrary distribution that we're trying to sample from. This is a very specific distribution with nice properties of smoothness. And also we have these parameters like the couplings of the theory with which the distribution changes smoothly. So you can think about training via, for example, annealing in those coupling parameters. And so you can move from training towards simpler distributions to training to more complicated ones slowly in a way that you know transforms smoothly. So you do have advantages here that you have lever arms on these distributions because this is a physics theory and we understand its properties that can help you with training. Um, but ultimately these are training uh, challenges of the training paradigms. Okay, I see another question saying, when, if so, do you plan to release the code? Yeah, so we're currently putting together a um, set of example codes that shows 
the scalar field theory example and also these coupling layers for the U1 field theory. So um, Tej and Dan Hackett and Dennis Boyder, so the, the postdocs and students working on this are putting together a really nice notebook system with annotated code examples and that should come out in the next few months. Are there any other questions? So maybe in terms of the multimodal, uh, are you exploring other losses like in GANs when you're looking at like a Wasserstein distance and all kind of variant? Yeah, so we've we've played a bit with other losses. So the the challenges, I mean, with using a completely different architecture like GANs, I mean, the challenges are that we need to know our probability density of the samples to be able to guarantee exactness in the end. If you just want to change the losses, we've experimented with this a little bit, um, but it needs to be very efficient to calculate as well, because we have to calculate very um, large batch sizes from our samples, and we need to be able to compute it from just the distrib just the samples from the model and no existing samples. So th those are the sort of boundary conditions on defining the loss, that it has to be um, fairly cheap, we have to be able to compute it only from the um, only from the model samples, and so we've been exploring in that space. Uh, the thing we're focusing on more at the moment is how to change the initial distribution to potentially make the flow itself have to do less work. Good. Um, oh, there's one, one more question coming in. Ah, okay, I see yeah. the question. What's the training cost? Are we using Horovod or something similar for distributed training? Yes, we're using Horovod. The training cost is, is large, but also particularly hard to estimate right now. We haven't actually tried to quantify that because of course we've been exploring, you know, trying training one way and then backtracking the model a bit and trying a different, trying some different hyperparameters, trying a different um, learning rate and so on. And so because of this branching of training and explorations, we haven't gone back and said, let's train a model from scratch and really cost it out. So that's hard to answer, but at the moment they're, they're very significant. And so we see the advantages really coming in the fact that it looks like we might be able to train once and then take that trained model and retune it for all the different parameters we might like to be interested in. So even if the training cost costs more than say sampling an entire ensemble for HMC, which at the moment it does, you get access not just to one ensemble, but to lots of other ensembles at the same time for one upfront training cost. But quantifying that is something we need to, we still need to do. There's another question in the Q&A. Okay, I see a question that says, what is your stopping criterion? Since you're neglecting the log Z term and the optimization, shouldn't the loss be an overestimate of the KL divergence? Yeah, so the, the minimum of the loss is, is minus log Z. Um, and the stopping criterion is when we reach a plateau in, in the loss. So for the fight of the fourth theory, we had a stopping criterion, which was reaching a fixed acceptance in, in the Markov chain Monte Carlo steps. And the reason for that was to be able to compare very clearly to um, hybrid Monte Carlo, where you, you tune the parameters to a fixed acceptance. So we could compare you know, at the same acceptance for those two methods. For the U1 theory, we just trained until there stopped being improvements. Okay. A, Another question, has there been similar modeling work employing energy-based models for the machine learning modeling part? I don't know what that means. Could you clarify your question, please? Uh, yeah, hi. So, uh, like the energy-based models basically work on the assumption that uh, any data inputted uh, will output 
through the neural network an energy uh, term which can be used as a surrogate uh, for, for the like the energy of the, the data point so here since we're working with energies is there any way that the energy inputted outputted for an, from a neural network could be used as a a part of the ml like the mcmc rejection acceptance step ah right so yeah we've been thinking recently actually one of our collaborators carl kramer had thoughts along a similar lines if you train um say a, a different neural network so not not the flow model to give you the action then maybe in cases where the action becomes expensive to commute to compute you can do sort of a, a pre accept reject accept reject step using your machine learned approximation of the action which which tells us um, the probability density here and then only actually calculate the accept reject step using the real action for configurations which have already passed that criteria so you can then sort of compound your flow model with an accept reject parameterized by a neural network giving you the action and then um, finally your accept reject to guarantee exactness. Uh, right, so that would also include extra upfront training costs in the, in the form of uh, matching the output of the action to the actual action, right? Yeah, that's right. Right, okay, thanks. Okay, I see another question that says, why do you need the final Markov chain after training the model? Could you use all the samples from p tilde but assign them with different weights that are proportional to the likelihood ratio, just like an important sampling? Yeah, so you, you certainly could, but given that you also need to do an amount of computation on each sample after you've generated them, and that that amount of computation is non-trivial, you don't want to do that on a very large number of very unlikely samples, which are going to be significantly downweighted. You, if, if the physics that you want to do at the end is, is cheap compared to the sampling, you could certainly do that. But it just doesn't make practical sense when on each configuration, you still have a lot of computation to do. Ah. I, I see a question of how does this relate to a normalization group flow? Yeah, so okay, closer to a renormalization group flow would be some work we did before about trying to use multi scale methods. So trying to use met, trying to learn a map between the um, parameters of your action on a coarse configuration that goes to a fine configuration, which is, you know, very close. Um, which is, that's exactly what you're trying to learn there. But this is actually close to a related concept of the trivializing map by which you map your distribution into a trivial distribution, which you can show via a specific set of transformations based on, on gradients that you, you, you can actually do. And so this is really trying to get at a um, computationally cheaper approximation of a trivializing map going perhaps not to, um, to perhaps a different trivially sampleable distribution. Yeah, I might have another question. If you, you have these graphs where you're going to a higher resolution, essentially, um, can you push it even further than, you know, beyond that simulations nowadays in terms of dimension? Or is there something which is completely not yet, not yet feasible? Um, so, I'm sorry, going to a higher resolution, so you mean going down to finer and finer lattice scales? Yes, exactly, yeah. Yeah, so our, we haven't yet trained any models that go to much finer lattice scales than we're doing in um, current lattice simulations. So if that's the question, we're still actually trying to get to the scale of current state-of-the-art lattice simulations and haven't pushed it further yet. But ultimately, if we can beat critical slowing down, that would be the hope that we can get down to finer scales where HMC just breaks down and we just can't currently do calculations there, but this method will let us get there. Okay. 
think we had also a lot of questions in Q&A during the talk, but uh, Ted answered a lot of them already. Um, so, um, ah, there's a final, there's a final question. Ah, yes, I see it. It says, is there a physical interpretation for the flow of variables imposed by the model? So, so not really. We, we have looked at ways of enforcing a physical interpretation of the flow of variables imposed by the model. So for example, if you start with the free theory and train towards a strongly coupled theory, then you can also try to guide the flow along increasing coupling, for example, by forcing it to, to have certain couplings at certain points in the flow. But we're not putting any such restrictions on the flow at all at the moment. So as, so as far as we know, in terms of the physical flow, it could be doing you know, U-turns. It could be doing all sorts of things. Um, but it's, it's possible that moving towards different initial distributions and trying to force the flow into doing something more physical that might be an improvement. We're exploring these sorts of ideas. Okay. I think, um, yeah, we've had a lot of questions. Thank you very much for this very nice talk and also, um, you know, for taking your time to, to answer these questions. And yeah, um, I hope all the participants enjoyed this talk as much as uh, we did here. Um, yeah, and also, yeah, and the other organizers would like to thank you again for a very nice talk. And thank I hope uh, we see you uh, in two weeks again. Okay, thank you. Great. Thank you.